Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. And to our viewers at home, happy Friday. I'm Marjorie O'Brien. I'm a host of Capital TV, and I've been asked to pose questions submitted by reporters all over southern New England to our governor, Dr. Alexander Scott, and DOA Director Brett Smiley. We're going to begin with Tara Granahan from WPRO Radio. Governor, to follow up, and since Mayor Alorza held a Twitter town hall at the same time as your briefing, have you spoken to the mayor and Spanish radio stations in order to get them more involved? Yeah, I have. I have. And in addition, uh, I'll be doing a town hall with Commissioner Infante Green next uh, Tuesday evening, focused on the Latino community. Uh, m members of my staff have been doing Latino Facebook and radio. I'm going to start to do more. Um, I have a meeting this afternoon with the Latino advisory group that I put together. So we are really trying to double down on our efforts. And certainly I would encourage every, you know, the mayor, he's doing it. We all need to do more for exactly the reason I said at the beginning, which is um, vulnerable populations, non-English speaking populations, we really have to keep our eye on that. Uh, so we don't have an outbreak, and so we keep everybody safe and healthy. Next question is from Tim White of WPRI Channel 12. I believe this is for the doctor. Data shows Central Falls now has the most cases per capita in Rhode Island. Besides population density, is there something going on in that community that would explain what's happening? It's what we are continuing to unpack and understand. We do know that uh, certain communities have higher proportions of people who are members of the critical infrastructure workforce and need to be able to go into work. So a big part of our focus is helping to make sure that uh, entities where we have larger communities of people from uh, certain areas have the support they need for social distancing, for screening, uh, and for uh, face cloth coverings or masks that need to be worn. Uh, but the engagement that the governor referred to with community members, uh, the messages that I have said with our health equity zones and many others throughout the state are going to be key to help us understand what additional measures do we need to take to address the um, number of cases that we're seeing in certain cities, communities, and zip codes. So work is continuing to be done with that. Sure. The only thing I was going to add on, I mentioned that we're doing the walkthrough sites, and we want to have a walkthrough site in Central Falls to do more testing. Lots of people don't have cars. We want to be in the community, and then we'll get more information. Um, so I just thought that was important to say. I mean, D Nicole's right. We need to do more. And that's a community that's heavily affected, and so we will do more. Next question is from Michael Bilo of Motif Magazine. U.S. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said in interviews he objects to giving free money to governors in a blue state bailout and suggests the bankruptcy route, including defaulting on pensions. How will this affect Rhode Island? How would you respond? Mm. We are not going to declare bankruptcy. We are not close to that. I'm not going to let that happen. Uh, so that's point number one. It's going to be tough. Balancing this budget will not be easy. We will not default on pensions, not as long as I'm governor. So that's also out of the question. Uh, also, it's not blue state. I was on a call an hour ago with 48 governors on the call, and Democrat and Republican alike are saying the states need more assistance. In fact, President Trump himself has shown public support for a $500 billion additional state and local stimulus. And I've been on the phone with our federal delegation uh, in the past three days, and there's a fair degree of confidence that there'll be another stimulus bill coming to states and localities, which, by the way, is necessary, and I'm going to keep fighting for it. So. Um, you know, I think that's a lot of political rhetoric, which is what it is, but what our job is to do is fight to get the stimulus because the people of Rhode Island need it and deserve it. Frankly, the people of America do. Next question is from Richard Asnoff of Convergence RI. Two BH Link workers tested positive for COVID-19, yet remaining workers on the job were told that they cannot be tested for days, putting them at risk, according to sources. Risking BH Link becoming a hotspot. Why delay testing for healthcare workers doing essential jobs on the front line? 
Thank you for that question, Rich, because it is important for us to make sure that testing is done in the particular settings where we know it can have an impact. That has been our focus and continues to be. So I'll engage um, with our uh, team, and I know work is being done to make sure the appropriate infection control and testing strategy is implemented. We do know because of the number of tests being done, the supplies that are available, there may sometimes be a time frame where we're working to close that gap and make it as soon as possible. Um, but I'm sure the message is that we want to uh, support the staff there at BH Link for the important work that they do and help make sure they get tested. So I appreciate this being raised. Doctor, the next question is from Kathy Gregg of the Providence Journal. I'm going to break it down in stages. How many of the nursing home fatalities happened in a hospital and how many in a nursing home without ventilators and ICU level care? Um, that's data that I can um, work with our team to provide a little bit more information on. Uh, many of the nursing home fatalities unfortunately did occur in uh, the nursing home where they were being cared for, oftentimes with people not having very prominent symptoms, but because we have talked about the fact that this is a very medically and physically fragile community within the nursing home, sometimes a small shift in um, their hydration status or temperature, or appetite and ability to eat as a result of a viral infection could contribute to an unfortunate outcome. So um, that's what may be happening in certain situations within the nursing home setting. I've shared before, as it um, uh, seems as if it's understood, that um, ventilators and ICU uh, settings uh, are really made for a hospital where acute care is occurring and not so much in uh, a, a nursing home uh, setting. And to continue Kathy's question, do the nursing homes have Rhode Island Department of Health approved standards for who goes to hospital, who doesn't? Yes, there's an uh, overall understanding with the medical directors overseeing nursing homes as well, the staff, all understand that when there is a concern for the residents, uh, they're very familiar with the need and ability to um, get someone transferred to a hospital to receive a more acute level uh, care that exists. We work very closely with uh, nursing home facilities uh, to support those approaches, which uh, they understand and follow very well. Governor, the next question is for you from Brian Crandall of NBC10 News. What do you say to critics who point out that hospitalizations are staying steady and remain well below projections and call for quicker businesses reopenings as more than 180,000 Rhode Islanders are out of work? Yeah. Look, it's a fair question. It's a question I ask myself every day. So first of all, it's a good thing that we are holding steady. You know, as I said at the beginning, we're, we're holding steady where we are. That is a good sign. And hospitalizations are holding steady. A good sign. It means we've done the right things to control this. Uh, we are, I just made an announcement today that we want to get back into the business of helping our hospitals to get back into business. On Monday, I'm going to have a lot more to say about reopening our economy. Uh, the the uh, stay-at-home order expires on May 8th. So we're going to get there quickly, and I'll have, next week is going to be a number of announcements about when and how and who we'll be able to get back to work. So I'm as anxious as anybody. Um, having said that, you look all around the country and the, wor the world, really, and you see that there are risks for jumping the gun or going before you're ready. This Monday, I laid out very clearly six metrics, six benchmarks that have to be in place. And it is my duty to the people of Rhode Island to make sure that we are ready before we hit go. And we're going to get there. We're going to get there very soon. I've already started to make some announcements today around hospitals, and Monday I'll have a lot more to say. Bill Bartholomew, Bartholomew excuse me, asks, Governor, any plans to expand pressers, infographics, et cetera, into languages beyond English, Spanish, and American Sign Language? Is there an info hub for other language speakers? 
Mm. It's a good question. So much of the information that we're putting out, we're trying to put out in multiple languages. I mentioned yesterday that um, for the walkthrough sites, it's Portuguese and English and Spanish, but maybe we could do more, and that's something I'll take into account. Yeah. We've also made adjustments to those who are um, seeing impaired. You know, we're tr each time we get this feedback from different communities, we try to do a little bit more, so I'll take that feedback. Next question is for Dr. Alexander Scott from Hannah Dickinson at WPRI Channel 12. How often are you seeing COVID patients dying from blood clot complications? How big of a concern is this right now for patients in Rhode Island? I appreciate that question. I don't have the data right with me in terms of the number of times there has been uh, a blood clot uh, associated with an unfortunate uh, death, um, but our um, Concern uh, does not exist in terms of any particular trends that we're seeing. It's more similar to what I explained earlier in regards to a viral infection like COVID-19 impacting a medically fragile or physically fragile um, population uh, leads to that risk for the negative outcomes that we are referring to. We'll continue to monitor the data, though, as well as along with states throughout the country to see what else we can understand about risks and what's occurring in people who have unfortunately passed away. Governor, the next question is from John Howell at the Warwick Beacon. He notes that the question was raised yesterday during Governor Baker's press conference whether he would consider Massachusetts declaring bankruptcy. And he asked, given the tight financial situation and even with more than $1 billion in federal aid, is this an option being discussed for Rhode Island? Yeah. No, it's not being discussed, certainly not being discussed now. We'll know a lot more in a month from now around our actual financial situation. We'll know, uh, right now, we still don't have a good handle on exactly how much stimulus money is coming into the state. Um, we, you know, literally every day we get more information on additional stimulus for hospitals, additional, just, just today the president signed a bill on ad additional federal money for testing and PPE. Uh, as I explained earlier, Congress is very likely to pass another stimulus bill to make up for revenue shortfalls for cities and states around the country. So in a month, uh, we'll have a better sense of what does the state's revenue look like? Are people getting back to work here? What's our total federal stimulus? And then we can really get to work and start to think about how do we balance our budget? Um, but I, no, bankruptcy's not on the table. That would be a horrible outcome for any state. It's never happened in our country's history and it's not time to start thinking about it. It's time to start thinking about how do we get creative and solve our problem and balance our budget, and that's what we'll do. ABC6 News Director Kelly Johnston asks, we spoke to a hair salon owner who wrote to you asking if there was a way to reopen <laughs> salons earlier than you're planning now. Are you hearing any ideas that might allow salons to reopen sooner, and how are you handling <laughs> your hair? Sorry. Uh, it's long. It's overgrown, like a lot of people's. So I haven't said anything about when salons would be reopened. I would like to get them opened as quickly as possible. And this week we've made a lot of progress on that, um, talking to salon owners. And I think there will be ways to safely reopen barbershops and salons, um, you know, with appropriate cleaning on a daily basis, limited number of customers, keeping customers far apart, wearing faith cloth face masks, excuse me. So we're on it, and I think I'm hopeful. You'll be pleasantly surprised with what we come out with. Um, and in the meantime, just remember that you are eligible for unemployment insurance, hairdressers, barbers, salons, even though you haven't ever been in the past. Christian Winthrop from the Newport Buzz asks, in response to coronavirus, you've done what was necessary to make distance learning successful. When do you think it's time to take this a step further and mandate the regionalization of schools to reduce system-wide redundancies and waste while cutting costs as Rhode Island faces enough to economic times? Yeah. So let me say this to give you a view for where we are right now. We are very much 
every day in the trenches fighting this fire that is the coronavirus. So just to give you a feel for it, you know, I spent all night and most of the morning on the phone with Director Gaynor because we can't get our hands on enough gowns. We are still struggling to get our testing really where we need it to be. We spend every waking moment trying to figure out how to get hospitals back in business, how to get hairdressers back in business, how to get money into the pockets of small businesses today to roll out this new PPP initiative. So uh, eventually, we will get to the business of answering excellent questions like you have, which is, okay, how do we do some restructuring to be thoughtful and creative to, rebalance, to balance our budget in very tough times. We're just not there now, and I can't take my eye off this ball right now. We've got another month ahead of us of, you know, we, we've, we're trying to reopen an entire economy in the face of a global public health pandemic, and we're gonna nail that for the people of Rhode Island, and then we're gonna get to the really hard work that you're talking about, which is, how do we make the tough choices? And I am absolutely open, and I agree with you. It's time to get creative and innovative and reform-minded uh, and figure out how do we make difficult fiscal choices and be creative and make sure, most importantly, that Rhode Island and our workforce is more resilient and better skilled on the other side of this than we were going into it. Our last question today is from Stephen Tridman of Eastside Monthly. Your daily analysis cites all of the cases in the 39 cities and towns. Can you extend this breakdown to the 85 zip codes so people can see the COVID-19 picture in their own neighborhoods? Why, yes, Stephen. We can, and we are today, so those maps will be coming up. I want to again thank the uh, tremendous work of the data teams at RIDO and across the state that um, makes us probably one of the only states that has zip code level data so that we can better understand how to be targeted in getting to the communities most at need. So thank you. Thank you.